Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Spectre of Communism podcast. We have a celebrity in our midst. <laughs> We're joined by a previous guest, Fiona Lally, who is the National Campaigns Coordinator for the Revolutionary Communist Party. Chances are, if you're watching us today, then you recognize her from demolishing Suella Braverman, ex-Home Secretary, generally odious Tory on GB News. And we're going to play a little clip of that right now. The, 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 we're going back to the mm. marches now. Mm. Um, the issue of the march is, of course, everybody has the right to peaceful protest and expressing their views. But what we have seen, and I'd be interested in your views, is anti-Semitism. Mm. Uh, we've seen from yeah. the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That is an anti-Semitic chant yeah. calling for the eradication of Israel, the eradication of Israelis and the eradication of Jewish people. No, you're a liar. You're a liar. On every single one of these mass protests, right, there is a huge Jewish block. In all of these encampments, the encampments that you went to today, even in Cambridge, talking about all this kind of stuff, the Cambridge group, um, Cambridge Jews for Justice, they said, you are weaponizing their identity to promote a culture war. And, that, and that's all this is, because you've got no actual real policies or statements or anything to offer people in this country. Let's be honest, the reason you're here and the reason you went today is because you want to be the leader of the Tory party, you're interested in your career, you're interested in promoting that, so that's why you come out could, with, could your, I ask, with your could life. I, could that, I ask that, I mean, this is, um, to be honest, I'm um, And that's oh, yeah. completely false to call the march cool. anti-Semitic. People don't believe that. I, I just get chills whenever I watch that. that <laughs> incredible work. You yes. absolutely wiped the floor with her. Um, and I think he spoke for millions. I mean, people were watching that and thinking, this is everything I've always wanted to say to Swella Braverman. But no. I don't want to waste your time. You're not here to listen to me. Uh, Fiona, what were you trying to achieve out of that interview? And how do you think the amazing response it's enjoyed can be explained? I think the reason I did it is because for everyone watching the news over the last couple of months, it feels like we're being gaslit on a monumental scale in terms of what is actually happening in, in Gaza and the defense of what is happening by every single mainstream political party and the media as a result of that. And so it was an opportunity to try and cut through all of the hypocrisy, the lies, and just say what is and say the truth, which is, you know, a genocide is taking place. And, and these people are, you know, doing everything they can to support it. And as a result, they don't they're not allowed to claim any kind of moral superiority or moral righteousness um, as Suella was trying to do towards the end of the interview. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think it was an opportunity to just, you know, call them what they are, which is war criminals. And, and yeah, let other people know. And I think people already know this, that there's, there's millions of us out there who, who think the same thing. Um, so yeah, it yeah, it's incredible. Fun. GB News is a pretty right wing uh, yeah. media outlet, and I think it goes to show how out of touch this layer of the ruling class and their mouthpieces are, yeah. because they were so proud of that interview and they put "You're a war criminal" on the thumbnail. Suella Braverman retweeted the interview, presumably yeah. thinking that something that she said would resonate. But she was so demonstrably exposed. I mean, the point, I actually got a call from my dad after your interview, and my dad's not, not political, but he said it was the point where she was trying to explain what genocide is mm. and how actually the 100,000 people dead and maimed in Gaza, that's not really genocide, technically. Mm. I mean, mm. it really just shows the, the cynicism of these people. And, and as you said... The, the polls are clear. Most people in Britain and throughout the world do not support arming Israel in the way that our ruling class is arming Israel. Exactly. And, and not just that, that they're out of touch on the question of Palestine, although this has become the, the central issue, but on everything, right? Mm. I, I was trying to get across to her that, you know, the majority of people also hate the Tories. Mm. <laughs> they hate her specifically. Um, but yeah, the Palestine movement brought her down and people are livid because the same people who are 
you know, advocating for genocide, although they won't say it that explicitly, are the same people attacking us um, and attacking the working class and implementing austerity. And people can connect the dots. And that's also why um, it was important to to get that across to her and, and have that opportunity um, because she is, I mean, like I said, you know, she is trying to just become the leader of the Tory party. I don't think she'll get very far with that. That was, that was so sweet. <laughs> um, said that. That, but, was, uh, yeah. that was another punching in the air moment. Yeah. Um, it's all connected. Yeah. And actually in a previous appearance by one of our comrades, Ben Glenecki, uh, who is the uh, National Secretary of the Revolutionary Communist Party, he made a similar point uh, mm. when he was speaking with another odious Tory MP, Jonathan Gullis, when he said that the policies that the government um, enacts, not only do they result in death and destruction abroad, but they kill people here. Uh, he cited the million people who've died, the excess deaths that have mm. resulted from austerity policies, which actually both of the main party supports, um, just in the same way that there's very little difference between the Labour Party and the Tories when it comes to the question of Gaza, you know, Keir Starmer backs Israel to the hilts. Mm -hmm. Similarly, austerity kills thousands and thousands of people at home. And you were really effectively making the point that it's not just a question of supporting genocide. There's a general human cost domestically throughout the world that flows from capitalism. And you yeah. connected that point really well. And Braven was saying, well, do you support that? Do you support the other? You said, well, what about the system you support? That's why the, the yeah, the interviews had such a big response is mm. because it's this sense of, you know, they, these politicians do everything they can to slander the movement, to attack all of the protesters. I mean, Suella Braverman, obviously, when she was Home Secretary, was doing everything she could to calling them hate marches. And actually, that's having a new round in the press at the moment. They're talking about how the police need more powers to shut down these, these protests. But it's important for us to say, you know, to put them on trial and say, no, you're the criminals. Um, and what does your system represent? Because it's, yeah, that's, I think that's why it's resonating with people. Absolutely. As, as well. Funnily enough, uh, Braverman actually had her say in the Telegraph mm -hmm. just yesterday because prior to the interview with, with Fiona, she went down to Cambridge University with Patrick Christus from GB News, who was the presenter that you saw in the clip, and tried to interview students at the encampments, and all of them gave her the cold shoulder. And there's this hilarious, unintentionally hilarious, awkward video. It looks mm. like one long blooper reel <laughs> of her getting completely rejected by all these students. And she tries to make a lot of hay about this in this article. She talks about protesters' unwillingness and inability to discuss rationally and with others reflects a more worrying trend when it comes to left-wing militancy. Well, first of all, as you correctly pointed out, why should they speak to somebody who's just there to slander them as terrorists, sympathizers, and anti-Semites, who isn't there to engage in good faith? Adam Booth from mm -hmm. the RCP made that point previously on GB News that night. But also, she conveniently leaves the fact out that a, um, a revolutionary communist who's been active in coordinating our intervention in these protests very much did present uh, her ideas and answer Braverman's point of view and lies that same evening. Um, I don't think it's that surprising that she fails to mention this because <laughs> it didn't look great on her, no. I have to say. No. I mean, this is just another example of how uh, I think a lot of these politicians, because they can't be honest about the fact that the reason they support Israel is because they follow the interests of American imperialism in the whole region, right? That is what drives the Western involvement in what is taking place. But they can't just say that. So they have to pretend they're concerned about other issues. They're concerned about Hamas and they're mm -hmm. concerned about anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Braverman and, and, and not just Braverman, all of them do so much um, slandering against the movement and against the protesters. But the problem now, and especially, you know, with that interview and, and, and everything else that's been happening over the last couple of months is it, it doesn't work. Yeah. It's not cutting through in, in the way that it might have done in previous times. And I think that's connected to the the general distrust of, of them as well. Why would anyone believe anything that any of these MPs have to say? Right. Um, but I think also it shows the difference between 
the way that left reformists, when they're attacked with these spears about anti-Semitism and these attempts to deflect from the real issue, the way that they've responded, I'm thinking about Jeremy Corbyn, for example, and the way that he allowed himself to be destroyed, they bend over backwards, they apologize, they give ground, they try to say, no, 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 um, we, we, we take these questions very seriously. And rather than doing what you did and what any, any left winger, anybody who's standing up justly in defense of the right of the Palestinians to have a homeland against Israel's war of slaughter in Gaza and turn it back on them and say, no, you're a liar. You're lying. You're you're whipping up these smears to distract from the fact that you are the real criminals. You're the ones whose behavior and policies are indefensible. And look, it's very clear that there is a huge anti-establishment mood all over the world. I mean, that is just a general feature of society right now. And uh, that can go in different directions. It can go in a left-wing direction, but it can also go in a right-wing direction. Right. What people are looking for is someone to, to stand up or people to stand up or ideas to come through that represent something fundamentally different from what they see every day and what they experience every day. Um, and it's true that some people mistakenly on the left try to be clever about um, putting forward their ideas and let's just patch up capitalism in this kind of way. But that that doesn't you know, speak to people's genuine experiences. So it's very important that we, um, yeah, stand for the fundamental transformation of society, essentially, and, and put that forward. Because everyone all over the world, and these protests, obviously, the encampments, they started in America. Right. Um, that because the same problems that capitalism produces in terms of a global war, but also, as we were saying earlier, domestically, are being felt by young people, being felt by workers all over the world. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And we'll talk about the international angle in a moment. But I think it was really interesting. They were obviously trying to give the impression that the Revolutionary Communist Party is solely and only responsible for these demonstrations. They were making the point or trying to make the point that these aren't really students of these demonstrations. This isn't an organic student movement that's arisen in opposition to Israel's crimes. This is the result of outside agitators, uh, people going in and fomenting discord. First of all, as yourself and, and Adam made the point on GB News, of course, these campaigns should want to broaden out and involve the working class, involve wider layers of society. But also, um, it's an excuse they use to justify the repression. And they try to say that this isn't really the attitude of students. This isn't really what most students feel like. But it is. I mean, mm -hmm. this movement, as you say, spontaneously erupted. Uh, at Columbia University in the States. And after that, it spread all over the world. It spread across the northern border first to Canada, but then it got as far as, as Europe, Australia, Japan. We actually uh, had an episode last week where we spoke to comrades from Austria, Canada, the US mm -hmm. and Britain about these encampments. So why do you think it is that um, this question of Palestine has become this focal point for the class struggle worldwide? I think one thing we should consider is that a lot of the young people, university students involved in the current movement um, just experienced Black Lives Matter a couple mm. of years ago or the huge climate strike protests, Fridays for Future, as when they were school students, right? right? We have a whole generation growing up at a time in which capitalism globally is producing nothing but war and tragedy and misery. And as you say, Palestine now has become the main prism through which people are recognizing that the people in power, the rich, the bosses, the politicians are hypocrites and they're liars. And whilst they're telling us that there's no money and that people need to start saving, lowering their expectations, inflation is soaring and all of this kind of stuff, they're somehow finding the money to send billions in aid to Israel um, militarily, financially, but also politically, um, and, and not just in Israel, in loads of different places. There's wars happening in a lot of places in the world. Um, and yet their day-to-day -day lives, they're experiencing hardships and their living conditions worsening. And, and young people are, are looking at all of this and thinking, what is my future under this whole system? And looking at people like Joe Biden or Genocide Joe, as they've correctly 
titled him and thinking, you don't represent me or my interests in any way. And, and, and so this, there's this kind of mask that, you know, is normally there, I would mm. say, over government and institutions that they're kind of neutral figures who are trying to do what's best for everyone. But it's just become completely transparent that the only thing they're interested in is maintaining a certain world order that suits the capitalist system and maintaining their geopolitical interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and talk about the mask slipping. I mean, Lenin talked about bourgeois democracy being the smiling mask which covers the dictatorship of capital. Mm. And we're really seeing that mass begin to slip, not only because the ruling class and their mouthpieces are you know, laundering and materially facilitating this genocidal war. On the one hand, that sort of so-called commitment to the so-called rules-based order mm -hmm. has been completely demolished. You know, they spent all this time for the last couple of years um, wagging the finger in Putin's direction because yeah. of the invasion of Ukraine. But then Israel carries out a war which has killed far more civilians, according to the official figures. And yet, not only are they not saying anything really to hold Israel to account, they're not doing anything and they have the means to do it. I mean, in the case of Russia, there's not a great deal they can do to stop Putin from, from carrying out the war. Mm -hmm. But in the case of... Um, Israel, in the case of the war in Gaza, if Joe Biden turned off the arms supply, that'd be it. <laughs> the, 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 the war could not proceed. But not only that, we've seen the repression of free speech, the attempt to curtail freedom of assembly and protest. There's been the repression of students at one university after another. Comrades of ours have been arrested or threatened with arrest in a number of countries. We've had comrades who've been injured by the police. We've seen videos of students being attacked by uh, riot police and state troopers with batons and stun guns. So... This lie that in a democracy you can say what you want to say, mm -hmm. you can protest if you want to, it's being completely exposed over the course of this. Actually, your ability to say what you think and to protest stops precisely at the point that the ruling class's fundamental interests, as you described, uh, are threatened. Yes, look, they're doing everything they can to shut down on the protests. Obviously, in America, they responded with real brute force, hundreds of arrests. But also in the UK, Rishi Sunak had a meeting with these vice chancellors to talk about how to clamp down on it and, and stop it growing. The best defense, and actually the only defense really against all of these clampdowns is to grow the movement. The students have, have, have shown the way. They've been the spark to start something at the moment, which is, which is excellent. And actually in a lot of the encampments at the moment, our comrades have been having teach outs on May 68, um, which was a, a movement started by students in the universities, but then grew to the workers and youth. And that's how spread into a real revolution, which ultimately is what we need right. um, to overthrow the warmongers in, in Britain, but also internationally. And so what's very important is that at these encampments, there's discussions had and plans, concrete plans made about spreading the movement to the workers, going right. to workplaces and saying, can you come and be a part of this? Can you discuss what you can do in your own workplace to organize people? Uh, that is absolutely vital. Um, to keep things going over the over the summer. Fantastic. So obviously the Revolutionary Communist Party has been intervening energetically at student encampments across the country. Do you have a rough idea of how many campuses we've intervened at? Yeah, I think we've intervened at about 20 places. So Fantastic. Yeah. And the Revolutionary Communist International, of which the RCP is the British section, has intervened all over the world in campuses throughout the USA, in Canada, there was a really good um, presence by the Austrian comrades of Defunca at the University of Vienna. There are many more. You can find reports of many of these via our website. And at all of these, we are raising the points, raising the arguments, raising the program that Fiona outlined about the need to um, break out of the isolation of just the campus protests and to connect with the working class, uh, because that's what's necessary not only to you know, defend the encampments from repression, not only to strengthen the movement, but to actually seize the ruling class by the throat and to prevent them from supporting Israel's war. Look, you know, if, if, if you're able to cut off support to Israel by winning over workers at the docks 
uh, as we've seen in India, in Belgium, and other places, if you can connect with workers in the civil service, workers in the tech sector. We saw a strike by Google workers um, over their company's um, support for Israel in terms of building computer systems for their defense network. These are layers of society that have the power to actually prevent, not just to protest, but to prevent our ruling classes' support for Israel's war, to isolate the Israeli war machine. Exactly. And, uh, you know, there was a big demonstration, um, in, in London and just on Saturday mm -hmm. commemorating the Nakba. And one of the points we were talking about at the demonstration is you often see a lot of union flags at these demonstrations, which is very, very good. The unions have a lot of power. Mm. Um, and, and union leaders should do everything they can to organize their members, especially if they're in, um, especially industries that are more closely connected with the war machine. But the thing is the war machine affects everything in terms of where um, investment takes place, right? That's why the universities, that's why this protest is taking place because at least in Britain, hundreds of millions, I think 450 million pounds is invested by universities, either in the state or in arms um, companies. Yeah. This pours into almost every aspect of society. Yeah, turning student fees into blood money. Right. But the what that means is that Everyone in society can play a role in some way in, in trying to organize against it. And, and, and the unions can, and I think should do a lot more as well. I totally agree. Um, now, this, as I say, has had a massive international response. I've seen uh, reactions to your interview with Suella. I should say your one-sided beatdown of Suella Braverman <laughs> coming in from India, from America, from the Palestinian diaspora. I believe you're speaking with Al Jazeera later today. Yeah. So um, this is you know, crossed continents. It's crossed language barriers. It, it's really struck a chord. So I think that it's only appropriate that I now just give you the last word and say, if you're watching this podcast and you were inspired by the things that Fiona said to Swather Braverman, what is your message? I'd say that look, people hate Suella Braverman. They hate all of these figures because they see them as the architects of all of the horrible things that are happening in the world. And it's true, they are. Suella Braverman plays a direct role and is complicit in, in the genocide that is taking place. But she is just an expression of a whole system, which is the capitalist system that drives war. War is the product of capitalism. And, you know, you quoted Lenin earlier. Lenin also said once that capitalism is horror without end. And so what we are trying to do as the Revolutionary Communist Party, which we had our founding Congress just a couple of weeks ago in London, what we are trying to do is build a force capable of overthrowing the entire capitalist system, going to the root of all of the horrors that are taking place in society right now and replacing that with a system based on need and not profit, a system where people have housing, they have healthcare, they have education, and we invest not in bombs or war or anything, but in, in human beings and, and what they need to take society forward. But we think that the only way that that's going to take place is if we build a genuine revolutionary party. Um, and so if, if people agree with the message, the most important thing that they can do is join Join us um, in that in that struggle. Absolutely. So I'll put links to where you can find out more about joining the Revolutionary Communist Party if you're based in the UK. If you're based anywhere else, the Revolutionary Communist International, to which Fiona also belongs, um, is holding its founding conference on the 10th of June, and you can register to attend that uh, via the internet. There's going to be a fantastic series of discussions and you can find out more about how to join your local section of the Revolutionary Communist International. We've got a presence in about 60 countries worldwide. So if you were um, punching the air and celebrating <laughs> uh, Fiona's performance on GB News, then there's a good chance you can join us where you are. Fiona, there's a few more things I think that we need to plug. Yes, we have a meeting this Thursday online on Zoom. We can put the details in the caption. Um, and it's a meeting to organise uh, for all students and all supporters of the encampments uh, across Britain. 
so that we can put forward an idea and basically make a plan for how we can keep things going over the summer and prepare for a massive anti-Tory freshers campaign. Um, I think a lot of the university management vice chancellors are, are trying to just wait it out because summer's coming up and they think the students are going to go home. What we're going to do is make sure that actually what's taking place are real planning meetings. One, to expand the movement to to the workers so that we can start to make more of, a, of an active difference in, in terms of what's happening. So yeah, that meeting is on Thursday at 6.30pm UK time. I'm and sorry. I'll put a link to where you can register for that meeting as well. It'll be a really, really important meeting. I think it's a critical juncture for these encampments uh, in Britain, but also everywhere else. So if you agree with what Fiona said, then please do register to attend that meeting online and finally i believe you're going to be making daily podcast appearances uh that's the plan anyway on the rcp's podcast um hopefully we'll be doing a podcast or kind of short video updates uh commenting on on what's taking place what the tories are saying and doing and giving a bit of an out an analysis from a revolutionary communist perspective if people want to tune in there you have it so tune in every day for updates from fiona on british and world politics from a communist point of view fiona it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much and if you enjoyed the podcast please do consider registering and joining us in the fight for communism for socialism in our lifetimes, for revolution, for an end to all of the horrors of capitalism. The Revolutionary Communist Party, if you're based in Britain, and the Revolutionary Communist International's founding conference on the 10th of June, if you're based outside of the UK. Thanks so much. Solidarity. Divest and disclose free Palestine. <laughs>